And as I was a community manager back in 2003, before Facebook existed, anyone remember like that time, like yes. free yeah. Facebook? Yeah. People were like, you were community managers back then? Yes, there were tons of them. Um, so sort of the, the a premise of today's talk is thinking about what is the value of community and how can we sort of elevate that in today's workplace that has become very digital, um, but still requires this like hyper-connected sort of personal touch in order to really get results. <laughs> uh, so the, the general sort of idea of this like I, it, of business value is that a lot of times community managers are looking at sort of like how do they validate their role within the organization? How do they get buy-in for budget? Um, how many of you guys know General Assembly? General Assembly. So I, I was their first marketing and business faculty member there. And the very first course that we actually taught was community management. And it sold out the first day we put it up. And then we turned that one-off class into a, uh, I think it was like a seven-week course back then. Now we do 10-week courses and we kind of have rounded it out with supplementary topics. Um, but we were sort of thinking about community and we're thinking about how do we give entrepreneurs skills that help them scale and build their businesses. So when we put all these elements together, the, the idea was, was that if we can think about the people in our businesses and that our businesses touch, we're going to end up with a much better result, not only from a day-to-day -day perspective, but from a bottom line perspective. So I've been um, a consultant now for, I don't know, like eight years. And I started all the way back in the print days as a journalist. And so when you kind of look at that trajectory from the outside, or if you look at my LinkedIn, it doesn't always you know, add up in terms of like the steps. How does one get from a journalist all the way over to being a business consultant, right? It sort of doesn't, people ask me this all the time, they're like, how did you get there to there? So the general idea, and this has everything to do with business value, is that journalism taught me everything about asking amazing questions getting people to tell you things that they don't want to tell you, giving you additional resources to talk to and other sources of information to validate against, and then being able to craft amazing stories that move people to actually read it. So I was fortunate enough in 2001 to get a job with the Boston Globe. It's sort of like the journalist's dream, right? And it was there that I decided I wanted to dip my toes into the marketing side of things. This really had everything to do with the fact that it seemed like on the journalism side, there wasn't as much sort of uh, respect for the craft from an external perspective. And so for me, it was really interesting to go from being a journalist, working for the business of journalism, and then going into a marketing role on the business side of the house. The business side of the house on, at the Boston Globe was much smaller, obviously, in, in 2001 or two than it was sort of on the journalism side of the fence. And so what, we really were, what I was really looking at from a career perspective was, okay, how do I prove myself? How do I actually get people to like, listen to my ideas? And so I used that storytelling mechanism, that general understanding that people are at the heart of everything. And I think the number one metric that we need to think about when we think about sort of business is, what is the connection to the bottom line? So if we think about sort of tying this together, Journalist, what happened after that? Journalism actually really teed me up for community management. So Crunch, I was uh, doing some personal training and group exercise while I was a journalist. I don't know if any of you have been journalists, any journalists in the room? We are significantly underpaid individuals. So I got my personal training certification and my group exercise certification. And so first thing in the morning and then late at night, I would be like cranking on those two things. And I did all my story writing and all that during the day. And so these two things actually came to play when Crunch asked me, would you like to build a community for us? And I sort of looked at them. I've been a competitive athlete my whole life, grew up a swimmer, did triathlons in high school, and then kept racing throughout college. And I sort of looked at them and said, doesn't Crunch have community baked into it? It's a gym, it's fitness. Everyone has to interact with each other. You guys have a really fun brand. And it was interesting because even they at the time didn't really have a strong answer for why does Crunch actually need a community? All they knew was that people were at the, the core of their business, and in order to think about how do we retain customers, how do we acquire new customers, how do we do all these things, we had to think about the people. And so I literally got recruited into this job for the reason of I knew how to tell stories. I'd actually done some freelance event work um, in college as well, and because I understood fitness. And they were like, we'll figure out the rest later. So my brief starting was, 
We want to connect with our customers and we want to make money. And that was the general premise. 2003, figure out how to do it. We didn't have the digital tools. Email marketing is not what it is today. We didn't have social media. I think we actually had MySpace at one point during my trajectory at Crunch. Uh, but we all remember how useful that was. <laughs> so I had to really think about how do I use events and the little bit of sort of community tools, the forums that we had available, and some of those other things to drive business value. So the one thing that was really fantastic at Crunch, and I will always love my first sort of boss there because she was the head of customer service. And because she was based out of Atlanta, which at the time is where Crunch's sort of customer service and servicing center was out of, they gave me a second sort of boss that was in the marketing department at the corporate office. So I automatically from day one, without HR meaning to do this, got two bosses because they were like, well, she's young, we better give her somebody local, somebody's got to hold her accountable, even though my brief was customers and money, and that was it, right? So they gave me, so I reported in to the head of marketing, and I reported in to the head of customer service. Well, the head of customer service, God bless her heart, was afraid that she was going to get pushed out because she was in Atlanta, and she didn't say this in the beginning. Um, but so what ended up happening was she started setting up all of these meetings for me with key executives in the company. And let's be honest, I was 20 at the time. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna meet with the COO? Well, what am I gonna say to him? But I, had, I went to business school and I'd been to you know, competitive athletes. And I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna talk about sports. We're gonna kind of draw some parallels here. It's gonna be fine. And then, um, <laughs> right, 20 walking into this meeting. And um, it was really interesting. The most valuable meeting that I had during this whole setup of me and all of like, the senior team leaders was the head of regional sales and the head of regional operations. After I sort of had some of those daunting, like, okay, meet the team players. And so I asked what I thought at the time was a stupid question. I said, what metrics are you held accountable for? Because we're trying to define mine, and I know that I'm going to be held accountable for something. Right now, it's people and money and then we have to flush that out because I can't be responsible for the entire bottom line. So what are you held accountable for and how can I help you? And it ended up being, those two questions paired together ended up being the most brilliant things that I ever asked. And I got these amazing answers. I'm like taking all these notes, a former journalist and me, I like walked away with like five pages of notes. And I got back to my desk and I called Kelly, head of customer service, she was the VP of customer service, and I said, Kelly, this is what they need. And she goes, yeah, no shit, go do something about it. And I was like, Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna go do something about it. <laughs> and basically what this all kind of means was everybody else sort of had these, these business perspectives and they were like, well, of course. And I was thinking, well, community is all about people, so I gotta think about the people. But when I went and talked to all the executives they were sort of putting me in meetings with, they didn't really care about what I cared about. They cared about what they were being held accountable for. The other thing is, is when you help people hit their goals, they are so much more likely to help you, right? If you're saying like, what are you held accountable for? How do I actually line that up? And then how can I contribute to that? Oh my God, I had so many friends in the company. At the senior level, all the people my age hated me. <laughs> hated me, they were like, what are you doing? Do you wanna go out for drinks? I'm like, ah, I don't know. So I'd go out to drinks and then they'd be picking my brain saying like, well, what are you in these, all these meetings for? Why is this happening, this and this? And I'm like, I don't know if I should give away my secret. It seems to be working. But now, 11 years later, it's easy for me to give away the secret. And as I've mentored countless community managers at General Assembly and through uh, my consulting practice at Kirk's, it's one of those things where I say, always ask people what they're held accountable for, what they're trying to deliver on, and how you can help them. So at the end of the day, people are thinking about themselves. Even though we all, from this human perspective, really want to connect with each other, sometimes we just don't have that ability to think beyond sort of the immediate, like, well, I have to do this, I'm held accountable for this, how am I gonna make that happen? So if you can align business objectives with your own objectives and the community objectives, it's amazing how things start clicking into place. So I'll give you another story. So that's sort of about sort of understanding objectives. And I'd say that the first thing that community managers need to understand in order to, in order to deliver value and drive results is how is the business tracking its success? And that could be that you sit down with a head of product. You could sit down with a head of retail, depending on the organization. You could hit, sit down with operations, customer service, marketing, all of that. And if you can't meet with the heads of the departments, like my boss was so fortunate to sit me down with to try to get some exposure for her and her department, because I was like her only representative in New York, go ahead and meet with the people at your level and understand what they're being held accountable for and together try to understand and manage up to what the, your own bosses are asking of you. 
And those are things that in the last three and a half years that I've been teaching community management at GA, I have had so many community managers come back to me and say, oh my God, that one thing that I did made all the difference in the world. People who've gotten $100,000 budgets to do an extra initiative, which in the CM world I think is a pretty large amount of money, right? How many of you would like $100,000 to go run an initiative, right? You're probably like, wow, that's really big money, I love it, right? So one of my students at GA um, was Corky's first head of community, and she was in my very first community management class at General Assembly. So if you just even think about all these little pieces, this is all community at the core of it, right? And so she did this kind of internally in a softer way, in her own personal way, and it really helped her build their community strategy. And then she was responsible for building a whole community team. Um, and I know that for her, that those questions have been really super fruitful. So second story. Let's think about moving from objectives to action. When you start thinking about moving from the objectives to the actual action that you actually are going to be executing on, right? What do you think about? When you guys are thinking about moving from your, your objectives to your strategies in the community, what, what comes to mind? Priorities and resources. Priorities and resources, absolutely. What else? Platforms. Platforms. Where are you going to do things? What else? Content, you need to have something to say, right? So how many of you remember the market crash? That was no fun, right? 2008, everything kind of blew up at the end of the year. So I decided, sort of being a female entrepreneur, I had opened my company for consulting. It was my first year in business, and I'm going, oh, this is not good. I'm like, I, what am I gonna do next year? My clients haven't left yet, but they're probably figuring out just about now that like the money's gonna run out. So I have to figure out how to contribute to that. So I went to this amazing event. How many of you know 85 Broads? Yeah, a lot of you, okay. So I went to an 85 Broads event, and I was like, females have to help each other. Maybe if we can all band together, since we don't have some of the resources the Boys Club has, maybe this will work. And there was a lot of women there, 150, which I was like blown away. I was like, wow, this is a big room of females. Not a, there was actually two dudes. There were two representative dudes. One was a husband of somebody, and one was the tech guy. <laughs> And the, the beauty of this event was, was that everyone actually was talking about in a very sort of community-driven, emotional way what their fears were. Some of them had already been laid off. You know, A5 Broad spun out of Goldman Sachs, so Lehman Brothers blew up, and the founder at the time had been an executive at Lehman Brothers, so that was just like a, let's just say it's a hot mess, right? Uh, and all these women, sorry, all these women were talking to each other about what they needed to do to rebuild their own personal networks. Well, one big takeaway, build your network before you need your network. Second big takeaway, you can actually band together to find solutions. So I offered to Janet, I said, okay, there's a lot of female entrepreneurs here and there's a lot of women who've been laid off, so maybe they should do something entrepreneurial while they're looking for a job. They may end up getting a job and then they drop the entrepreneurial thing, but maybe they actually find something that really serves a need out in the community. And what ended up coming of this was something that I am to this day extremely shocked by. Janet says to me, the founder of 85 Rods, she goes, come out to Connecticut and let's do a brainstorming session. And I was like, okay, that seems like a pretty long trip just to you know, come up with an event. Well, we ended up talking through a number of different things. And by the end of this four hour jam session with our whole team and a million whiteboards and photos later, she said, can you help me rebuild the network? I'm sort of looking at her. At this time, I think I might've been 24, 25? That was 25. And I'm like, you want me to rebuild the whole company with you? She had three people on her team at the time. My team was about just shy of 10. And I'm going, okay. And it, she said, well, I would hire McKinsey, but they're just not available. And I was like, well, that's a huge compliment. We're gonna rock at this. And so Janet and I and her team and my team spent three months vigorously trying to rebuild the business. Well, what was the number one value of a business like 85 Brooks? Their network, their community, their 40,000 female leaders and executives and the women who were coming up behind them that were all engaged in supporting one another. So we took this community platform, which at the time was a 40, 400 page Ruby on Rails website. So I know a whole lot about tech and that project just gave me like christening by fire. <laughs> and the beauty of sort of taking this technology platform and turning it into much more of a connection platform, we pulled in a ton of social media was if this had happened 10 years prior, our solution would have been extremely different. But we were able to build a community strategy across 100 countries, 40,000 members, 
using a technology platform to keep us connected and to help one another, to make introductions to one another, to um, solve each other's problems and to talk about things. And we started doing uh, live, we called them jam sessions at the time. Uh, you know, actual like video conferencing where we have a whole group of women on these, uh, on these chats and there would be a speaker that would sort of facilitate it. We'd go over a topic and then we said, okay, how are we solving for this? Now, does anyone know that 85 Broads was acquired last year? Does anyone know why they were acquired? No. They bought them only for the network. Sally Project, who bought 85 Broads, has completely rebranded the network and brought it into an existing business that she already has. So she, and she saw value in acquiring the network to be the next generation of 85 Broads, as Jana is sort of going into more of a retirement mode, in order to invest in women and make sure that women understand that the women who actually did all of that work in 2009 to save the network so that women would still have a place to sort of network with each other and support each other, could have a next generation of women investing in women. So in 2009, second year in business, I actually put money into 85 Broads. I was the youngest investor by probably 15 years. As we were going to market for a second time with more community related initiatives. And last year was one of these things that was so interesting because it sort of was like, it kind of, the acquisition happened. And for me, it was one of those moments that when Janet called to tell me that the company was being acquired and why it was being acquired, I kind of, I kind of didn't believe her at first. I was like, well, we've been talking about sort of what would the next generation look like for quite a while. And we'd actually been starting to write off some of our debt against it. And when she called to say, you know, there is a woman out there who has decided and ready to invest in other women and invest in the network and take it to the next phase of business, it was one of those moments that was like, we both didn't know whether to really believe it or not, but the power of that community and the connectivity that despite the fact there's a million different languages and a lot of different professional careers, that these 40,000 women have been helping each other for the last 15 years and that some another female executive who's you know made a significant impact in her career is willing to take money that she's made and reinvest it in the next generation of women. So kind of takeaway so far, we've got aligning objectives from crunch. We have the power of network, and it doesn't have to be a network-based business. I guess we don't have the TV. I have this awesome chart um, for the next kind of piece, so I'm gonna have to give you the, the visual without it. So how many of you guys know Lululemon? How many of you know their wonderful fiasco? <laughs> the pants are see-through because your legs are too big, right? It's terrible. Lululemon built their entire business very similarly to the way that I did things at Crunch off of the premise of community, of building a cult-like yoga following. And then the CEO decides, okay, well, people are complaining because their pants are see-through and they're pilling and the thighs and all this stuff. Well, we're just going to, it's the wrong women are wearing them. And it's really interesting what happened because the size two women came to the rescue of the size 12 women and said, screw you, Lulu women. It's not just a yoga cult of these, you know, skinny women who don't have that problem. And you know what? Those women actually admitted that they had the exact same problem. I actually have a bunch of tweets. So I'm going to have to share these out later via, via social or send you guys the deck. Um, but there were all of these amazing tweets, and the tweets, is, you know, there's plenty of uh, different channels for community, but it was amazing that Twitter was sort of this channel, right? Because people were putting out all of these phenomenal comments, supporting one another, saying, and the community that they built to build the business took down the business. So there's this revenue growth chart that I had that basically shows their sales in like 2011, like nice and high, right? Revenue growth. CEO says, Terrible, unkind thing. <laughs> That's essentially what happened. So revenue growth here, piss off the community, revenue growth here. So at the end of the day, you know, when we think about the value of community, so much of it is just putting the people in the driver's seat. In every single business, regardless of what you're selling, whether you're B2B, B2C, what industry you're in, it's all about people. It's about your people internally, it's about your people externally. And if we were to think more about the metrics that we can utilize from that perspective, we would be able to track community so much better. So let's take a quick page from brand. So brand is also has all of these intangible values, right? Of qualitative and quantitative metrics that's really hard to track, right? Brand has gotten further along in its trajectory and as a discipline and as a professional community around longer 
much further than community house. So one of the suggestions that I have for those of you who are trying to fight for the value of community, and one of the ones that I use often as a business consultant that uses customer engagement and brand as my toolbox of you know, useful tips and useful tactics to bring to the table to drive business growth, is if we can take more metrics from how brands are quantifying what they bring to the table, we will end up having metrics for community, more metrics for community that drive the ball forward. Now, tangible versus intangible, right? Tangible shows up on the balance sheet. Intangible doesn't. Now, when you're trying to fight for budget, that's often a hard conundrum, right? Tangible versus intangible. What I would encourage you guys to do is understand what the goodwill number is on your balance sheet for those of you that are at larger organizations, or how goodwill is calculated because goodwill in every organization is calculated slightly differently, but goodwill is how brand is tracked at this point in time on the balance sheet. Community has the exact same effect. So brand and community are two of the biggest drivers of business growth, and they can also be the biggest drivers of business failure when you look at a company like Lululemon, who butchered their brand by pissing off their community. So don't do this. So in conclusion, I would like to sort of kind of pull these things together. You want to think about the objectives that the business has and how can you align those with what your customers want and need and what you're going to deliver as a community manager or if you're a team of community managers, how you guys are going to deliver that. <coughs> Two, you want to think about what are the actions, the actual things that you can do to build value. At 85 Broads, when we went through that whole market crash, what are we going to do? It was really all about supporting each other and knowing that there was a number of things that people in that community needed. And we did so much customer validation work that we had a laundry list and then we kind of prioritized against it and did very specific actions that helped drive value for the people. And then the people ended up driving revenue. So when we focus on it in that order, the qualitative comes first, the quantitative comes second. And that is traditionally what we actually see happen in terms of business results when you focus on that. Then the last thing is, is thinking about sort of the outcomes and thinking about sort of the value that community can bring and how you can track against it. Because at the end of the day, there are metrics beyond engagement and um, you know, shares and some of the things that we use in social media that can actually be quantifiable whether it's goodwill or whether it's finding other ways of working with whoever is crunching numbers, whether you're in a startup and you're a couple people and you're benchmarking against your angel investors or your VCs, or whether you're in a larger organization that has a whole financial team and a CFO who says, this is how we understand things. That's how you fight for budget. And that's how you get the buy-in that you need. And honestly, get a seat at the table that you need to have a voice at in order to you know, elevate the voice of your customers. Thank you very much for your time and attention and happy answer questions later.